Hi, my name is George. My name's Tina. Hi, I'm Connie. Connie Barker. My name is Angel. Name's Frank, uh, from Planet Earth. Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, I'm Joe, how you doing? Uh, I am the wisest man I know, so tell you what, I've already sent the other guys home. You want me to sit here? Over there, here? All right. Red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. And to the back. Great, and to the right. Hello? Mom? Yeah. Like this, maybe? Close. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No, no, the earth. no, from, from the Christmas story. Oh, well. Where's that at? Uh, the water in my trailer. Needs to be filtered three times. Aw, oh, it's a baby. Then distilled, then filtered another three times. If I'll talk to you about Bob Barker later. It's okay. Don't worry about it. But he considered this. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. Those filters need changed. What? I shouldn't have brought my kids? Play Mary? Well, you have to audition. Um, okay, what's that? Audition means you read the script and I see if you're right to play the Mary. Oh, I thought if I just showed up, I got the part. No, it doesn't work that way. Tell me, why did you want to audition? Yeah, hold on. <laughs> uh, excuse me? Right. My mom let me audition. She said it'd be good for my personality. I think I have an awesome personality. Well, Mary was the mother of the Son of God. She had a lot on her mind. She had an angel talk to her that set her life on a whole new course. Yeah, that's cool. She was also a worship. That's cool too. I want to be worshipped. My mom didn't think of that. I did. That's why I have an awesome personality. <laughs> it wasn't about Mary. It's about the child she carried that we worship. Huge difference. <laughs> look, Mr. Director. Do I have to say anything? Can I just kneel and look at baby Jesus? I can do that. See? See? That was good, right? I can look at Joseph and back at baby Jesus. See? Oh, selfie! <laughs> so, do I get the part or what? I don't think you get it on so many levels. Let's try this. You see that Bible? Read Luke chapter 1, 46 through 49. My mom didn't have to read. Ugh. <laughs> my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, way cool. <laughs> what are you doing? Um, I'm Facebooking and tweeting this really cool moment to my followers. You have 49 followers, and two of them are your grandparents who don't even know how to use Twitter. <laughs> Look, I see how hard it is for you and even adults to believe it that it's not all about you. In a sense, we all worship something other than God. You know, the place you pour all your best energies, the thing that defines who you are, the thing that absolutely can't live without, <clears throat> the kind of God that will die if not plugged into the wall at night. <laughs> okay, true, guilty. Okay, I wanna do this. I wanna play Mary Luke longingly at baby Jesus. I think I have another part for you. It's not a flashy role, or even a role that would warrant a lot of mm, tweets, but it could be the greatest role of your life. Greatest role of my life? I'll do it! I haven't even told you what the role is yet. I don't care, I'll do it! 
You sure? Totally. What is it? Props. You'll be in charge of the manger scene. What? Not about you. Hmm. You know, even from a young age, we all struggle with that, right? We all struggle with making Christmas all about me. I, I remember when I was a little kid and we went to Grandma and Grandpa's house in Chicago. And, and, and um, when we went to Grandma and Grandpa's house in Chicago, it was all formal. You know what I mean? And, and, and I hated it because I had to wear, my mom and dad told me I had to wear these wool pants that were itchy and drove me crazy. Anybody ever there? And, and nobody? I'm the only one who's ever had, when they were a little kid, wear wool pants. It is the most horrible thing in the world. Yeah. And, and then, it, you know, it was this meal, and it was this meal that was like, yeah, yeah, it was a disastrous meal, at least for a kid like me, because I was the only grandson. And, and all the granddaughters, all of them, they were all excited. They thought, you know, it's great to all dress up. And, and they thought it was a privilege to sit through this long, boring, horrible dinner, all formal-like and everything, right? And there was tons of food, which th that sounds good, but it was kind of like lubies on steroids, only really formal, <laughs> high dollar. You, you know what I mean? My grandma, I don't know what she did, but she, like, she made three or four or five different entrees and, and, and all these salads and all these vegetables and breads and desserts and everything, which at uh, first sounds really good, except for my taste buds weren't quite that formal. And, and the conversation was long and boring, and what kid wants to sit there for two plus hours on these velvety chairs with those, yes, those annoying, itchy wool pants. The whole time, in my view, I can see the Christmas tree and there's presents under it. I mean, that's pure torture, right? Uh, although after a couple of Christmases at my grandparents' house, um, the presents weren't all that much better. Because my aunt and uncle, they got me the same thing every single year, like some sweater that I, I wouldn't want to be caught dead in. And, and my grandma thought it would be really special if she made something for me. Out of wool, yes. So that the next year I could be in these horrible pants. I, I, it was pure torture. It wasn't the Christmas that I wanted. You know, now today I, I look at my kids, and, and although I think my kids are a little bit better <laughs> than I was as a kid, um, I, I still see that, you know, for them, Christmas is all about them. It's all about those presents and those gifts that are under the tree, although some of you know that we don't have any presents under the tree this year, yeah, uh, unless our Christmas present that came early comes under the tree and starts eating some of the ornaments off the tree, then, then our presents under the tree. But even as we grow older, we're still egotistical about how we view Christmas. And as a month rolls, the frustration grows, and, and all of a sudden, then we're, we're, we're frustrated and ticked off when somebody cuts us off or is in our way or slows us down, or, or we start complaining about all kinds of things that, you know, why does Aunt Sally say that we have to have dinner at 4 o'clock? It's going to be hard for us to get there at 4 o'clock. And we got to dress up and we all got to look the same. you have any Aunt Sally's like that? Yeah? And, and why do we have to do it on Monday night? Don't they realize they got to work on Tuesday? Can't we wait till like actually Christmas or something? You know, we have all these different things. Or, or maybe we're, we're looking at, at the house and the decorations and the presents and the in the weather, we want it just right. And if it's not right, then we're totally disappointed. And then all of a sudden, Christmas isn't how we want it to be. Because it's all about me. This morning we continue the series where we're taking a look at all these different things that, that come into our Christmas that we, we carry along to Christmas that distract us from Christmas and how those things, the the issues of life, the plans, the dreams of, I just want everybody to be home and everybody to get along and everybody to do exactly what I want to do. It sucks us into this trap 
of making Christmas all, <laughs> all about me. And yet, here's the deal. Even though you and I, we are a part of the story to some degree, the reality is we're not the main character. The main character of this story is Jesus. And, and if we don't get that, if we don't realize that, then all of a sudden we will get trapped into this trap of making it all about me. And so this morning we look at a woman's story who had had actually some reason to think that the story was somewhat about her or even all about her uh, because she was front and center in this story and, and yet, unlike you and me, she didn't allow that to distract her. Even though she saw her role in the story, she didn't lose her focus on why and who the story was all about. So let's dive in. If you got a Bible, pull it out. Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. That's where we're going to pick up her story. If you got a smartphone, you can use that. You can log in or an iPad. You can log in to uh, uh, Facebook and check in here. Uh, and then head to this website on the screen where you can follow on and there's all kinds of stuff on there. Now, if you get to Luke in your Bible, you'll see that it doesn't begin with Mary. It doesn't begin there. It actually begins with Elizabeth. Um, and Elizabeth is a relative of Mary, an older cousin or aunt or something. We're not really totally clear except for that they were um, family members of some sort. But she's older, and she has this miraculous birth, too, that's happening. The, she was way too old to get pregnant. And even though she was way too old to get pregnant, all of a sudden, she is pregnant. Amazing. And she's pregnant with, a, with someone very special, and it's John the Baptist, this guy that we read about who is going before Jesus, preparing the way for Jesus. Um, and, and so it's not till we get to verse 26 that we get to Mary's um, story, and that's where we'll pick it up today. In, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, I know we've all probably read this a million times and stuff like that, but I mean, whoa, I mean, just think of that. An angel shows up, boom, right there. Pretty freaked out, pretty exciting, huh? I remember when I, I went to, in high school, I saw on the, on the, the wall, I made the cut for the basketball team. I, I remember when I, I, I was casted as one of the main characters in, in a play, um, a little bit older along the way. Uh, I remember three years ago when, when I got a phone call from a guy named Dave Walter who said, we're going to call you to be our pastor. Yeah, those were all like exciting kind of moments. Eyes wide open, there's excitement, there's nervousness, that's all part of it, but no offense to Dave Walter, but he's no angel, <laughs> right? And, 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 and this was not just any kind of angel, this is an archangel Gabriel who shows up and says, hey, you Mary, <laughs> you're chosen, you are highly favored, whoa. And she must have been overwhelmed with excitement and fear. Actually, that's what we see came out first was fear. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I would too. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He'll be great and he will, he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give you him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Think back to a moment where you, you got chosen or you got picked or you, you, you landed that job or you just did something that like was really special and people also congratulated you, way to go, you know, they were, they're praising you in some kind of way and, and all of a sudden you get these feelings inside, you know, you're like, wow, yeah, way to go, I, I did a good job, I, I'm maybe a good athlete or a good leader or a good musician or a good whatever, you fill in the blank, right? 
And those initial feelings that came of, of pride and excitement, those, those are good feelings. There, there's nothing wrong with those feelings. But here's the problem is we're kind of messed up people. We, we're, we're people that have this, this sinful nature that causes things like that to quickly go to a sinful place. So I'm coaching again. I'm coaching uh, kindergarten and first grade girls basketball. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> That's something to laugh about, let me tell you. All right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so I'm, I'm coaching this team, and, and I've done football recently, not like high school or college, like kindergarten, first grade football, and now I'm in, in basketball. And, and a girl, boy, it doesn't matter whatever sport it is, all you have to do as a coach is like teach some fundamentals and just pour on an uber's amount of positive reinforcement. It's just like, yeah, way to go, good try, good try. You missed the basket, you missed everything, but good try, you know, keep going. And, and every once in a while you get to a kid who all of a sudden they will take that and they will run with it. You know what I mean? Like, not in a good way. <laughs> Where all of a sudden it'll go to their head, and, and all of a sudden, and, you know, they might be doing pretty good, and, and they're sitting there, and they're like feeling like they're a good basketball player, and they're looking at somebody else, and they miss, and they go, well, I'm a good basketball player, man. Uh, you missed that shot. I made five in a row. How many have you made? Zero, you know, kind of thing, right? And we may not be in kindergarten or first grade, but no matter how old we are, we have this tendency, maybe not so blatantly, but we have this tendency to make it all about me. Look at me. Look at what I can do. Look at how I'm a part of this. Or we ask the question, what's in it for me? And yet, that's not the reaction we get from Mary. In fact, go down to verse 38 and look at how she reacts. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. You know, if, if there's anyone who had a reason to say that, you know, there's something in this Christmas story, it was Mary, let me tell you. Uh, I mean, everybody else had dreams or visions or something like that. Not Mary. No, she had like an angel, a real angel, like Gabriel, face to face talking to her. Whoa. She was a virgin, and yet she was a child, and not just with any child. She was with child with the, the Son of God, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the Savior of the world. And yet even though she knew she had a role to play, she also knew that she wasn't the main character that it wasn't about her. In fact, jump down to verse 46, where all of a sudden we get to this section called the Magnificat. It's Mary's song, and she says this, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. And it goes on from there. It's this beautiful song praising God, praising God. And it's modeled after another song that we see in the Old Testament of this other godly woman, faithful woman named Hannah. Maybe you've heard her story. Hannah was this lady who for years and years was praying and longing to God that he would give her a son. And finally, after a long time, God gave her a son named Samuel. And both of these ladies in their songs, they, they praised God for what God was doing and for the part that they were privileged to play in his, in his plan. Because, see, they understood their role. They understood that it was a significant role. They understood that, but they also understood that even though they were chosen for this role, they didn't deserve this role. And that it wasn't all about them. It was all about a part that they could play in God's plan. You know, as, as I read this, I, I'm kind of, kind of blown away with Mary and with all that we can learn from Mary because... And I know, you know, we, we sometimes sit here, and I come from a perspective, and uh, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but where, where we 
we get a little bit worried because we, we, we at least assume that, that some, some Catholics, they, they kind of uh, go a little too far. They fall into this trap of making Mary out to be a little bit more than what she is because she's not God. She's not perfect. She's not somebody to be worshipped. But on the other hand, clearly in, in many Christian churches, many Christians, they, they ride that pendulum way, way over onto the other side. Where then all of a sudden we overlook Mary. We dismiss Mary. We miss Mary and, and her huge example that she lays out there. That in her faithfulness and in her, her humility that she models what it looks like for you and me to be servants of God and love God and serve others. Because that's quite frankly, that's the role that she faithfully played out that first Christmas. And you and I, as people who know Jesus and, and trust in Jesus, that is the role that God has called and casted us to be in even this Christmas. Which honestly can be kind of convicting if you think about it. Especially during this time of year. Because I don't know about you, but um, this past week I, I went out to do some errands from time to time, and, and I'm pretty sure nobody ever saw me and said, now there is an example of a great servant who is loving God and serving others. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> and I wonder if, if there's anybody who says the same about you as you complain about, you know, that Christmas is in Memphis this year and we got to travel. Come on. Or that this year, with all the family things, it's like five different things we've got to go to. Or that, you know what, this year I'm so disappointed because at church we didn't sing my favorite Christmas carol. <laughs> or if we get all upset because, you know what, we didn't get everything we want on our Christmas wish list. And it begs the question, are you loving God and serving others or are you making your Christmas all about you and what you want? Which doesn't mean you've lost why Christmas came in the first place. Which honestly, in one way, you could look at it and you could say that you and I are the reason for the season. But actually, that's kind of in a negative way. Kind of a convicting way, if you know what I mean. Because all of a sudden you look at your temper that starts to flare during the season. You start to look at how ungrateful you are or even more the mirror as you look at your kids, how ungrateful they are for the things that they have, or you start to, to look at how, you know, um, you blow up at the different times. I, I just love this, you know, it's, it's, I can relate, you know, of yelling to the kids and everybody, come on, get out here and let's all get to dressed and ready and smile and look like you're all having a lot of fun because we're going to get this portrait taken whether, no, whether, no matter what, right? And then all of a sudden we are exposed for exactly what our Christmas is all about, which is us. And yet, it casts lights on the real reason for the season. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, a kind of unlikely place where we find a simple synopsis of this reason for the season. Pastor Paul here, he, he lays it out right here in verse 15. He says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which, of whom, I am the worst. And so he says, listen up. He says, this is the why and the who. Christmas is all about Jesus coming to save sinners like you and me. And so we look and we realize that Mary is a sinner and Joseph's a sinner. Paul, you, me, we are all sinners. We got lives that are filled with junk. We have lives that are filled with our own little messes, our own little chaos. <laughs> and, and sure, yeah, we, we, can, we can do a good job of 
covering most of that up and hiding some of that stuff behind a facade of you know, shiny, happy little faces and stuff like that. We can even convince ourselves at, at times that, you know, we're doing pretty good. We're okay, you know, or even that we are entitled to the things that we have or to how life is kind of centered around me. We can get to that point, but if we step back and we really look, all of a sudden we realize, we realize that we have this issue that's made us obsessed with ourselves. So honestly, it's made us treat our own self as if we are God. And we need someone to save us from ourselves, from our sin. And that someone is, is precisely what comes at Christmas. It's Jesus. And so we celebrate this season that in the manger and through faithful servants like Mary, our Savior has come to overcome that sin and, and to win us, win us freedom and forgiveness from, from the mess in our life, from the sin, from the obsession of ourself. And, and yet the story continues because every year as we celebrate Christmas, as we look back to God coming to, to save us through his son, Jesus, we continue that story, we continue that mission and as millions of people that we rub shoulders with all the time, they are in desperate need of saving and they don't know who Jesus is. And honestly, as, as we realize, we're not the main, main character in the story, but the story is about us, about saving us. That's where we enter into the story once again because then all of a sudden, God has called us to follow Mary's example. And that can be intimidating because I'm sure there's a few of us who say, yeah, but Pastor Dan, I can guarantee you no Gabriel is going to come and show up and say, hey, you who are highly favored, <laughs> because I'm not highly favored, because you don't know the junk in my life. I get that. And yet even us with lives that are stained, actually, especially us who have lives that are stained, God can use us in a powerful way. He can use us in his plan of communicating his mission. In fact, listen to what Pastor Paul says as he goes on. Verse 16, he says, but for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience or his grace as an example for those who, who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And you know what? This is Paul's song. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I can relate a lot more to Paul's song than to Hannah or to Mary's. Where all of a sudden I can praise God for what he's done and what he's doing in me and that he's using me despite me and carrying out his plan, his mission. This Christmas, my prayer is that you would remember that it's not about you. It's not about your plans. It's not about your wants. It's not about your preferences. It's not about your presence. It's all about, it's all about God's plan to save you through Jesus. And yet he has saved us and he has called us to be his servant, to, to love him and to serve others and to point others to him. And so my prayer is that that we would be like Mary, we would be like Paul, we would praise God, we'd be blown away by, by God and humbly and faithfully we would serve our God. May our life be a witness of what Jesus has won for us and may our Christmas be an invitation to the world around us of where our hope, where our, our joy, where our salvation comes, that it comes in Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that each one of us probably is convicted to some degree on how 
so often we make Christmas about ourselves, or, or honestly, we make our life about ourselves. How so often we, we lose focus of you. And, and yet, Lord, you have re- redefined us. You have, you have made us a new creation because of your son, Jesus Christ. You have, you have come in and you've taken what is broken, what is a mess, and you have redeemed it, you have forgiven it, and, and you now use it even as we continue to struggle with our sin. And so now, Lord, we pray that you would help each, and a, each one of us during this Christmas season and beyond to realize that it's not about us, but it's about pointing to you and to the hope that we have, the joy that we have, the grace that we have in you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.